members of the jury, in light of the expert testimony of the psychiatrist, it is clear that my client is suffering from schizophrenia and was in no way responsible for the crime he committed. He needs a mental hospital, not a prison. As prosecuting attorney, I have gathered expert psychiatric opinion to show the defendant was totally sane when the crime was committed. He should be punished to the full extent of the law. What is the correct role of the psychiatrist in the courtroom? Or in the prison? Should a psychiatrist color legal testimony with his expertise? Or should the psychiatrist defend the criminal as a victim of external forces? And what should be the convicted man's fate? Psychiatry and law. How are they related? I am Dr. Thomas Sass. It is my view that the use of psychiatry in the criminal law subverts and contaminates the judicial process and degrades and dehumanizes the individual accused or convicted of an offense. I am Dr. Bernard L. Diamond. It is my position that psychiatry and the other behavioral sciences have much assistance to offer to all phases of the administration of the criminal justice system. I am Alex Brooks. As a professor of law, uh, dealing mainly with the problems of the criminal justice system, I am concerned with the role, the proper and effective role of the psychiatrist, if any, uh, in the criminal process. As moderator of this program, I will try to focus attention on the issues that are raised between two extremes that are represented by Drs. Diamond uh, and Saas, and uh, try to structure the discussion so that uh, we can understand what the real problems in this field are. Welcome to the exploration of concepts and controversies in modern medicine one of a series of programs dedicated to examining the uncertain, candidly recognizing that much of today's teaching is necessarily based upon opinion and that the opinions of eminent physicians in a given field vary widely. The National Medical Audiovisual Center believes that openly airing such opposing views is a basic responsibility of medical communications. Professor Alexander D. Brooks, Rutgers University Law School, will act as moderator of this presentation. Now, Tom, <coughs> you've started out in what those of you who know you have come to regard as a characteristically provocative way by talking about the role of psychiatrists uh, who think of themselves as healers and helpers, humanitarians, and who are so <laughs> regarded generally by the public as uh, contaminating and subverting and degrading and dehumanizing. Now, this seems like a very harsh indictment of the role of the psychiatric profession in the criminal law. And I wonder if you could spell out what you have in mind. Well, uh, I will try, Alex. Uh, really, my view is rather simple uh, in this respect. Uh, my point of departure is that uh, the law, the criminal law, is essentially uh, a system of social controls. Uh, every society uh, has, uh, must have, uh, an articulation of what is acceptable and desirable behavior and what is unacceptable and prohibited behavior. And in modern uh, Western free societies, uh, the way to deal with prohibited behavior is through the criminal law, uh, through its sanctions and through its procedures, uh, which give a great deal of protection to individuals accused of crime in order to prevent innocent persons. Uh, from being punished. Now, psychiatry comes into this process through uh, the false representation that it is a medical science. 
uh, when in fact uh, it is my view that it's neither medical nor in its courtroom use scientific. In its courtroom use, psychiatry is a strategic intervention to achieve certain policy or social objectives, and more particularly because of its consequences, which can be involuntary incarceration, that is a form of imprisonment, through psychiatric auspices, it is in fact an ancillary to the social control system, to the legal system, the penal system. An illustration of this would be, and uh, in other words, because of its consequences, not because of its aims, but because of its consequences, it, is, it may be, it is dehumanizing in the law. Now, it is my general view that whenever psychiatry is used against the will of the individual upon whom it is used, it is antagonistic to him and not to his benefit. Uh, perhaps the simplest example I can give of this general contention is the phenomenon uh, which affects thousands of people throughout the country of individuals being accused of crime, apprehended and accused of crime, but not tried, but instead of trial being declared unfit to stand trial, even though they may verbally, quite clearly express a wish to be tried, they may have a lawyer who is quite willing to defend them, but nevertheless they may be declared unfit to stand trial by the judge and incarcerated in institutions called mental hospitals for years, often for life. Now, Bernie, I take it that you take issue with Tom on these points and that you probably have points of your own to make. Yeah, yes, uh, Alex. Uh, I, I certainly agree that the primary function of the criminal law I is to uh, uh, exert social control. But the criminal law has, has developed in a very complex way as a result of hundreds of years of tradition plus certain kinds of democratic principles. And uh, in enforcing the criminal law, it's very important that full consideration be given to a number of factors. In the first place, uh, the criminal law does not uh, punish or control people exclusively for their deeds alone. Uh, a deed is rarely a crime under the criminal law. Uh, for the criminal law to reach the decision that certain people should be punished or controlled or deprived of liberty, there has to be a consideration not only of the act that the offender has done, but also a consideration of what is called his mental state. In, in other words, a consideration of his motivations, uh, of the psychological factors which caused him to, to uh, uh, produce the criminal act, and, and particularly what the law calls criminal intent. Now, the law traditionally, and I think quite correctly, uh, excludes certain classes of individuals from punishment. Uh, certain uh, classes such as uh, children, uh, the insane, people who are, are uh, unable to, to comprehend uh, their, their responsibility to the prevalence of morality of society are sometimes excluded. Now, in, in a criminal trial, a whole series of very vital decisions have to be made uh, by the judge and by the jury. And even after these preliminary decisions concerning guilt, are made, then there are additional decisions concerned with sentencing and eventual release and restoration back to society of the offender. Now, it is my position that uh, although in ancient times the law made these decisions exclusively on the basis of uh, well-known common sense uh, principles of psychology and a rather oversimplified view of what the human mind is, is like, I believe that modern behavioral science, psychology, and psychiatry has a great deal of additional information which they can provide to the law which will assist the law to make these very difficult decisions. It is not my contention at all that psychiatrists or any other experts should usurp or take over the decision-making processes of the law. It is simply that the law sh is and should be even more receptive to the use of uh, what I insist is reasonably scientific information in, in ways which helps them to make traditional decisions, which at best are very, very difficult to make. Well, then, 
it seems to me that uh, your view that psychiatry has an appropriate function in the criminal law rests on the notion that there is a body of expertise that psychiatrists do have a contribution to make over and beyond what the ordinary lay person perceives as being uh, states of mind and the like uh, that are relevant to determining uh, what the punishment should be or what kind of treatment there should be or whether the person in fact is guilty or not guilty of a particular offense. Now perhaps Tom you take issue with this uh, notion that Bernie states uh, that there is a body of expertise, that psychiatrists do know more than the average person, and that the jury uh, ought to hear what the psychiatrist has to say. Why not? Well, uh, it is my view that psychiatrists certainly know more uh, about how to do psychotherapy uh, or psychoanalysis than lay people. But when it comes to uh, their courtroom behavior, uh, it is my view, and this is illustrated by the battle of the experts, that essentially psychiatrists are for hire uh, their participation is moral. Uh, again, let me illustrate this. Historically, psychiatrists themselves, this is not my view, psychiatrists themselves have been very proud and vocal in saying that they have declared defendants uh, insane uh, in order to save them from the death penalty. Uh, uh, this has been one of the traditional claims which they themselves have made. Now, this is not a scientific statement. This is a moral justification. This may be morally very nice. But it's nothing to do with science. Well, I, I, I think it can be related to science. I, for one, would quite be prepared to state that I have testified uh, in court uh, with the hopes of uh, saving a particular defendant uh, from the gas chamber uh, simply because I believe that I had quite accurate scientific information uh, about the, 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 the offender's state of mind at the time of, of the, the killing, uh, which is directly relevant to the issue of whether or not this man is legally liable to the death penalty. And when what I insist is reasonably accurate and scientific information is presented to the trier of fact, then in some instances the trier of fact is able to see that this man is no longer meets the legal requirement for the death penalty. Uh, have you ever testified that he should be put to death? No, I am quite w unwilling to, to play both sides well, of the fence my, here. That's my point, but you say it's scientific. Well, a scientific toxicologist, if he examines a uh, fluid, body fluid, sometimes finds arsenic and sometimes he doesn't. No, I, I have never falsely testified. Uh, that it wasn't my uh, point. It, uh, has, it has doesn't have to do with facts. It has to do with moral judgments. You testify in accordance with your moral belief that people shouldn't be put to death. That's a very respectable view, but it's not a scientific view. It's a moral view. But that isn't, to what, that isn't what I testify to. I testify as to certain kinds of information which I uh, have uh, been able to obtain from the defendant. And if I'm not able to obtain this information from the defendant, then I don't testify. But you're making an arbitrary distinction between the content of your testimony and the consequences and, and the, its aims, the aims towards which you are uh, striving. Well, in a sense, the jury is responsible for making the factual judgment, and even if you have two psychiatrists testifying on opposite sides of the fence, uh, the jury then evaluates the uh, testimony of either psychiatrist and makes a judgment in terms of its own finding of fact, its own moral judgments. Uh, what's wrong about that? Why shouldn't uh, there be this battle of experts? Is there anything that's distortive about it? I am all for that. I am all for this, because what happens when there is a battle of experts? It's like a battle of advertisers. It's no. advertising. One says buy ivory soup, the other one says buy uh, pa palm oil. No, no, the, the, and what the, the jury does is throw it out. The, no, says, it's, so that, the whole that, thing is no good, that which may, it isn't. That may occur, but that isn't a necessary consequence of the judicial process. That is, the, a, con excuse me, that is a consequence unless the defendant is so degraded that he cannot have representation. I, I, it doesn't have to happen that way. The battle of experts is largely a product of the fact that only very, very borderline controversial cases come to criminal trial. The great majority of criminal events, shall we say, are settled by the law on some other basis in a criminal trial. Uh, maybe 90% of all criminal offenders are dealt with by the law on some other way than a criminal trial. Now, those cases which are very difficult to decide, those cases which are raise very difficult borderline issues which are not easily resolvable 
are the ones that come to trial. And it is precisely that kind of case which requires the uh, full exploration of every conceivable source of information about the defendant so that the trier of fact, the judge and the jury, can consider all the various possibilities. Now, uh, obviously, a person who is a, a marginal case uh, uh, it exists in a, in a situation in which one can, could bring out this element which would prove his sanity and that element which would tend to assert his insanity. And, and this leads, I think, quite correctly to the presentation of diverse, uh, again, which I have to insist are scientific, uh, bits of information, as observations about this defendant, which should be taken into consideration by the trier of fact. Bernie, it seems to me that uh, while we focus so far on the insanity uh, defense and criminal prosecutions, uh, that in fact, by reason of the uh, lack of very many insanity uh, cases, that uh, the insanity defense and the role of the psychiatrist in the criminal process is really important to people and fascinating to them and of great concern in the criminal justice system uh, by reason of the symbolic importance uh, rather than the fact that there's a large volume of such cases. And the uh, symbolism of it is this. Uh, are criminal acts the product of mental illness? Uh, does the psychiatrist have an appropriate role in defining crime and in uh, classifying and characterizing uh, offenders. And then further, uh, once uh, it's determined that the offender is guilty of some offense, uh, a treatment program, uh, whether in a mental hospital or in a prison, uh, is uh, determined, uh, and the psychiatrist perhaps plays some role in that. Uh, the psychiatrist apparently has a tremendously important role in determining how long the uh, offender will remain in a hospital or remain in prison, particularly where we have a development of indeterminate sentences in which there's a large range of time uh, and with a great deal of discretion given to boards and bodies in which psychiatrists serve and which psychiatrists are asked to report to. Uh, so in fact, uh, I don't think we need to get too involved in the insanity defense itself, but rather, more importantly, we should be talking about the role of the psychiatrist in the entire process. Now, uh, do you stick to your notion, Tom, if we look at it in this very broad sense that uh, the psychiatrist degrades and dehumanizes um, and contaminates the whole process when, in fact, we think that the role of the psychiatrist is intended uh, to mitigate the harshness of the criminal law and to heal people who uh, offend? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Alex. That's, uh, that moves us along in a very important direction. Uh, Especially in situations where the psychiatrist, for example, uh, determines the length of uh, a sentence or incarceration. Uh, that to me is an excellent example of uh, uh, dehumanization, de degradation. Uh, it is to me the quintessence of a humane, uh, dignified system of social sanctions that the sanction, that the offense be clearly defined, the rule of law, and that the duration, the quality, the nature of the sanction also be clearly defined. Uh, in other words, if someone is sentenced to five years uh, in prison, to me that means that after five years he has a right to come out even though he is mentally not changed. Uh, so that I would, uh, uh, as, uh, as you know, I have in my writings analogized psychiatric, involuntary psychiatric intervention, for example, uh, in a prison, to involuntary religious intervention. If a Jewish prisoner goes to prison for five years, it's not a condition of his being released, let's say, in a Christian country, that he come out a Christian, or vice versa. In uh, other this words... This is the kind of brainwashing, which is not part of the sentence. The right of an offender not to... Not uh, to change. ...be compelled to change his not personality, change person. and presumably the psychiatrist is trying to change his personality. Now, the, the situation is described as one of helping him to change, to conform, but, uh, in fact, certain changes are being uh, perhaps imposed on him. That's Tom's view. What's your... Yeah, well, well Tom has, has described here a, a view of the criminal law, which I, I think that many people uh, uh, would, would find compatible with their own uh, 
desires. I don't think, however, that it is a correct view of the criminal law, nor do I think it has been the historical position which the criminal law takes in a democratic society. The, the idea that uh, crimes can be purchased by uh, a given penalty, that if a, an individual wishes to commit a robbery, as long as he is willing to pay the price of so many uh, years in prison, then he can commit this robbery, and when he's paid the price, he can go out and commit another robbery, and so forth. Uh, that, that is a, a, a really, uh, I regard a quite peculiar concept of, the con of crime and punishment. Uh, the criminal law is primarily, as you stated earlier, a system of social controls. And it's to stop the commission of crimes. And uh, I believe that society uh, ha has the, the, the right to do whatever is necessary in, in order to stop people from committing crimes, within providing, reason, within reason? <laughs> providing the constitutional safeguards yeah and civil liberties and the general principles of a democratic society are, are in operation. Uh, this means that the uh, uh, criminal law ha has a, a perfect right to retain people uh, as long as is necessary in order to prevent them from committing crimes, providing the decision-making process for their retention is subject to all the constitutional safeguards which are, are guaranteed to, to all citizens of a democracy. Now, I, I certainly do not want to uh, give a kind of a general support for uh, psychiatric testimony in, in the courtroom. I'm perfectly aware that there have been many circumstances where a psychiatric testimony has been used in a very uh, unconstitutional undemocratic fashion. I'm perfectly aware of the many situations in which the decision makers of the criminal law have defaulted their right and obligation to make the decisions and accept blindly the, the unreasoned uh, uh, testimony of, uh, of so-called experts. But because there are, are, are many defects in the system of uh, uh, the use of uh, psychiatry in the criminal law does not, in my opinion, justify throwing out the whole institution. Because I think, in general, uh, despite these rather glaring uh, examples of the misuse of uh, psychiatric uh, testimony, uh, I think, in general, uh, psychiatry has been a very, very helpful uh, in, in two specific ways. One, as in terms of mitigating the uh, uh, harshness of the criminal law, and secondly, in influencing society and the criminal law towards the directions of more humane and more effective ways of dealing with the problem of the criminal offender. Well, Tom, uh, would you agree with what Bernie has said that notwithstanding uh, illustrations that all of us are familiar with, occasional cases, perhaps more than occasional, in which uh, the use of psychiatry has turned out to be harmful, uh, that by and large, uh, the, the uh, use of psychiatry in the criminal law has had the effect of mitigating harshness and also has had the effect of giving uh, real meaning to the individualization of criminal offenders, uh, which is one of the important uh, continuing developments of criminal law. Uh, not to treat all criminal offenders in a uniform way so that everybody who commits a particular offense gets exactly the same sentence, uh, but to treat them as individuals and to uh, determine just uh, how the system should respond to them. Uh, some persons who commit homicide may be susceptible to release to society within a few years. Others may have to be kept in prison for the rest of their lives. Uh, do you agree with... Uh, uh, Bernie's notion that individualization is desirable, or are you in favor of treating everybody uniformly regardless of individual characteristics? Uh, well, something in between. I certainly, let me make my position clear. I don't believe in treating everybody uniformly. I believe that it is the job for the jury and it is a job for uh, enlightened criminal law to make distinctions among various types of offenses, like first degree murder, second degree, involuntary manslaughter, and so forth. Uh, so that I think, I believe in these distinctions. What I don't believe in, and uh, in fact, uh, what Bernie describes and what you have described uh, and characterized as 
individualization through psychiatry, that I consider the essence of tyranny. Tyranny is often thought of as something that's very harsh. No, to me, tyranny means arbitrariness. The psychiatric intervention may be invoked or may not be invoked. The person may be released after two years or may be kept for 20 years. And this depends upon the judgment of experts. This, to me, is the, what is uh, my model for this is the inquisitorial method. It's again the accusatorial Anglo-Saxon model. But what is your alternative? My alternative is essentially the, the image expressed in the Roman symbol of justice, blindfolded, impartial, even-handed justice. Therefore, similar offenses, similar or identical penalties are meted out. And there is no, there is no psychiatric intervention at all into the judicial process. I would abolish. Yeah, well, that's Psych psychiatric intervention in the judicial process altogether. Yeah, well, that's again a, a, a view uh, of a somewhat abstract and idealized criminal law in which criminal law or society through the agency of the criminal law deals only with deeds. Uh, and, and this is a very attractive and very seductive idea so that if the deed is a killing of another human being, th then the law deals with that deed and, and punishes accordingly. Now, I, I think it's very fortunate that, that the criminal law is not at all that arbitrary and that rigid. There, there exists uh, concepts, uh, statutory and, and traditional definitions of, of crimes, which allows a, a great deal of individualization of, of the criminal law. And I believe that the psychiatrists, as well as other behavioral scientists, uh, sociologists, psychologists, and the like, have a, a lot of information which they can provide to the law, which enables or which will facilitate the law making the kind of individual decisions which it has to, to make. For example, uh, the, the crime of killing other people is not just a simple crime. There's a, almost a dozen legal varieties of homicide, uh, ranging from justifiable homicide, which, care, which is not a crime at all, through uh, such things as uh, misdemeanor manslaughters that may mean uh, two weeks in jail, all the way up to first-degree murder, which may mean uh, death in the gas chamber or the gallows or life imprisonment. Now, the law uh, sets forth a great many criteria by which these distinctions are made. Now, most of these criteria are based not just on the physical events of the criminal act, but many of these criteria require very specific knowledge about the psychological attributes of the, of the individual offender, the state of mind. And here, I think the psychiatrist is often in a very special position to provide a concrete information about the state of mind of the offender, which enables the jury to make a more just decision. All right, I think that we're at a point where we uh, understand... Uh, Part two will present the conclusion of psychiatry and law. How are they related? The opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily constitute endorsement by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, the Public Health Service, or its constituents. We continue with part two of Psychiatry and Law. How are they related? Now, as we concluded uh, in the last half hour, it seemed to me that 
there were two major issues that we were talking about on which perhaps we ought to uh, continue. Uh, the first deals with uh, what we uh, in the law talk about as the issue of criminal responsibility, uh, namely the responsibility of a person to the law for the acts that he has uh, committed. The second issue that I think we ought to address ourselves to is the uh, way in which uh, our system deals with people after uh, a judicial adjudication has been made, either that they are offenders and criminals or uh, that they've been acquitted and it's been decided that uh, they're not guilty, but in fact they have some condition for which treatment is uh, called for. Now turning to the first issue, uh, I think that uh, uh, there's been an enormous amount of controversy about the various tests for insanity. Uh, I think that these tests, uh, whether appropriately formulated or not, reflect four basic functions of the criminal law. Uh, one of these is to deter others from committing crime. The second uh, is uh, to rehabilitate persons who have committed crime. A third uh, is to incapacitate persons who have committed crime so that they can't go out and commit further crime. And then finally, a fourth uh, is the ret uh, retribution or revenge function, which still exists, uh, although uh, most people would like to uh, think of it as uh, absent from our uh, criminal system. Now, it seems to me that the psychiatrist has a role uh, in at least three of these four uh, functions or objectives of the criminal law. Uh, certainly, he can help determine whether the particular offender was deterrable or was not deterrable, uh, and uh, perhaps a, a social judgment can be made whether um, acquitting him by reason of insanity would have any impact on the general deterrence of others by reason of the fact that he seemed to get away with it, if we'll put that in quotes. Uh, in the rehabilitative function, of course, the psychiatrist has a very important role. Uh, in uh, the incapacitation function, it seems to me there, too, the psychiatrist has a role, because, in effect, uh, what the psychiatrist is asked for is to make a prediction as to whether this person who has committed this offense is likely to uh, commit it again. Uh, should he be incapacitated for the rest of his life, uh, because uh, he's too dangerous to release to society. And it seems to me that psychiatrists are asked to make that judgment over and over again. Now, uh, in any event, uh, and without spending too much time on it, uh, psychiatrists have found over a period of time that these objectives, which everybody agrees about, are not adequately articulated in terms of legal tests, uh, whatever these tests may be. Uh, so that uh, the psychiatrists are asked to uh, testify to what, in effect, are legal fictions. Uh, there is enormous dissatisfaction about the way the law has uh, presented itself to psychiatrists. Now, uh, on that assumption, there is a trend away from concentration on the legal test for insanity uh, or determining uh, whether a person is responsible or the extent of his responsibility. And now there is a great uh, a trend toward considering the role of the psychiatrist in what we'll call the dispositional uh, stage or dispositional process of the criminal law. We've determined either that the uh, accused person is guilty or that he is uh, not guilty, but something has to be done with him. That is to say, he either goes to prison or he is sent to a uh, mental hospital. And uh, psychiatrists are now concentrating on what the role is of the psychiatrist in that situation. Uh, Bernie, what do you think is the appropriate role of the psychiatrist? Well, I, I certainly agree with you that it's uh, a dissipation of, of uh, important resources to uh, limit the psychiatrist to just such issues as insanity or, or, or responsibility. Uh, th those uh, issues, particularly when psychiatry is used to establish an individual is not responsible, in a way takes the offender out from the uh, whole system of criminal justice and, and exposes him to, I think, very particular abuses. 
uh, and in some sense uh, exposes him to the possibility of very gross uh, violations of his civil liberties. But you, you can't entirely separate the issues of criminal responsibility and insanity, uh, particularly diminished capacity, from the issue of rehabilitation because the law's determination of guilt and responsibility places very important limitations upon the uh, rehabilitation and treatment prospects in relationship to sentencing. If, if a man is sentenced to die on the gallows, it's, it's rather futile to speak of, uh, uh, of his rehabilitation. But uh, assuming that an individual is going to be sent to prison and that there are certain options available to uh, society in dealing with, with that person, then I think the psychiatrist has, again, certain kinds of important information which uh, have a bearing on uh, the way the society should deal with, with that offender. So that uh, if the man is not going to be confined to the rest of his life, or he's not going to be executed, then, then the, the, the issue that the criminal law must deal with is what procedures from now on offer the, the best possibilities of restoring to society at the earliest possible time an individual who is, is safe for society and, and who is no longer disposed to the commission of crimes. Now, it would be terribly naive to suppose uh, that psychiatrists have uh, the final answer to this issue. But, w but we do have some information about what motivates people, what causes recidivism, and particularly the psychiatrist has a lot of information as to what qualities of uh, institutionalization and prisons and punishments can be very damaging to people and can enhance the tendency to recidivism rather than aid in the reform. So the psychiatrist it can be utilized not only to decide such uh, or to help in the decision making as to how long a person should uh, spend uh, in an institution before he can be released, but, but also he has a lot to say about what the character of those institutions should be. What, what kind uh, of uh, activities there should be, whether there should be treatment programs and what kinds of treatment programs and, and the like. And so that I, I really do believe that in relationship to sentencing, in relationship to determination as to how long an individual should remain in, in an institution, at what point is he ready to be restored to society, what is the likelihood of him getting in difficulty at all. Ag again, psychiatry has certain kinds of information which uh, should be valuable to the decision makers. I do not at all believe that the psychiatrist should be the decision maker here. Mm -hmm. Here I support the idea that those uh, authorized uh, groups in society like uh, judges and, and adult authorities, parole boards and so forth, should, should make these decisions. Well now, all of this, Tom, sounds very good uh, if we assume that the psychiatrists, in good faith, are using a certain amount, a substantial amount of expertise, that they have research findings, uh, that they uh, understand uh, the uh, personality problems of offenders, that they have case histories, uh, that they have checked out their results over a period of time, they've made longitudinal studies, they have some confidence that the recommendations that they make as to uh, predictions of what this person will and will not do are reasonably reliable, accurate, valid. Uh, if, if indeed this is so, then uh, we, I don't think we could escape the value of all of this. Do you agree that this is so? Well, Alex, as you know, that uh, opens up a tremendous, uh, uh, the large area, and suffice it to say for me here that uh, I don't think this is so. This is, this is all uh, a self-definition of doing good, uh, which perhaps can be analogized uh, to the Inquisition, which after all was very important. I'm not using the term pejoratively, I'm referring historically to the Inquisition. It's a very important aspect of uh, Western Christianity for four, for four centuries, in which uh, inquisitorial interventions were after all defined and authenticated and accepted in society as good. Uh, well, uh, obviously the victims did not share uh, this judgment. Now, similarly, uh, we must ask here, uh, who is to define whether these things are good? Uh, the defendant, uh, the prisoner, or the psychiatrist? 
or society. Uh, let me make uh, my point clear, uh, on, on perhaps on an example. Uh, when I hear this kind of uh, uh, description of what psychiatry does in the courtroom, uh, I'm struck by the fact that uh, uh, how much it technicalizes and medicalizes what are overwhelmingly moral problems. For example, uh, Mrs. Margaret Sanger uh, was a nurse, uh, went to jail uh, in the early 1900s in New York City for teaching women how to use birth control. Now what does it mean, let's assume that uh, she's now in jail, what does it mean to rehabilitate her? She should give up her idea that birth control is a good thing, that a woman should have a right to birth control? Uh, Gandhi was in jail, Bertrand Russell was in jail. What does it mean to rehabilitate these people? Now I'm not uh, romanticizing crime. Uh, this is not to uh, be equated with my approving uh, of uh, criminal activity. But a great deal of crime is a moral, uh, social, human protest. And the question is, what, is, what are we doing? Uh, are we trying to enhance the dignity of this individual or are we trying to diminish his dignity? I think psychiatry is very effective in diminishing his dignity and enhancing the dignity of everybody else who is outside of jail. Well, well, I don't think we should confuse these two things. All right, so uh, you're, you're posing the issue of dignity on one hand uh, and uh, non-stigmatization of the uh, offender as uh, crazy, uh, as against what uh, Dr. Crazy, Diamond... Less than human, misguided. Yeah, misguided. I, 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 he has to be I, 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 he's I, stupid. I would concede the point that psychiatry, like the criminal law and like any social institution, can impose upon people labels which are, n are nothing but really degradation ceremonies. And to say that a person is crazy, to say that he's schizophrenic, to say that he's insane, is certainly a, a way, or can be a way, of degrading him. And in many instances, uh, in fact all instances, is probably regarded by the recipient of that label as a more degrading uh, designation than uh, to be considered a convict. But it doesn't have to be that way. The fact that psychiatry and the criminal law are capable of the grossest abuses and misuses, uh, again, doesn't mean that we should abandon these institutions. Uh, a diagnosis can be a, a label. It can be what I've called an instrument of social action, so that you use a diagnosis to put somebody away and deprive him of his constitutional rights. But a diagnosis can also be a very revealing and very helpful way of communicating information to, to others and to the individual himself. Now, I think that a psychiatrist who is involved in the legal system is perfectly able in most instances, not infallibly, but in most instances, from, uh, di in, to distinguish between the Margaret Sangers and the... the uh, the young men who are in prison because of draft evasion and the like, and to refrain from applying to them uh, degrading labels. Uh, at the same time, uh, the psychiatrist is able to deal with another type of prisoner who I think is much more common than the Margaret Sangers. And these are very, very confused persons who have been victimized by uh, continuous sets of social situations, uh, psychological disorders, incapacities of all kinds, kinds which have, have made them kind of the, the, the victims of society uh, rather than the protesters. And uh, I think in these individuals, who I regard oftentimes as sick, uh, can receive a great deal of understanding and help which makes it, it, it possible for them to be restored back to society at a much earlier time and much less damaged than I I if the naked, revenge, retributive, punitive aspects of the criminal law are applied to them. Uh, I, Alex, if I may, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, Bernie, uh, you said that they can receive help. Really, uh, uh, our disagreement hinges on who defines help. Uh, now, in that sentence, who is the one who is defining help? The psychiatrist or the offender? Uh, I, I think this, this varies. I, I, I think in the most desirable situation, one uh, defines help in terms of the view of the defendant and, and uh, of the patient. And I certainly w would take pride in the fact that I have uh, successfully treated 
uh, criminal offenders and obtain their, their release. And this was with the full uh, consent and full desire, and I might say the, the gratitude of, of, of the particular individual's concern. There are very special and I think somewhat unusual instances when a, a individual himself is not always the best judge of what should happen to him. I, I don't think, for example, you are doing any favor to a, uh, a, a person who has been institutionalized in either a prison or in a hospital if you let him out and it is inevitable that he's going to go out and kill somebody. I don't think you're doing any favor to a person to uh, allow him to commit suicide. Well, but I that know that you and I have a very fundamental disagreement about this point, that you feel that people should be uh, entirely self-determinative. No, 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 I you see, you are no. attributing, excuse me, you are attributing yeah. now general views to me yeah. about, uh, I was yeah. trying to focus it uh, yeah. on who determines whether something is helpful, which is ascertainable by whether or not the defendant or the prisoner asks to see a psychiatrist asks to go to an hospital, or whether it's a judge, or his lawyer, or the prosecutor who asks for it. Well, I, I, I think that, that society sometimes has to make that determination. But, uh, but you are uh, making now a, a moral judgment, which is fine. Uh, I am trying to focus on how things are, and simply makes the statement that it is my view that when this is done against the expressed desires of the individual, then this is degrading to him. Of course, I think it could be said mm -hmm. that even if it's with his consent, and I would agree with both of you that the issue of consent uh, may be an important one. Uh, a lot of psychiatrists who have studied the uses of psychiatry in the prison system, as well as in uh, mental hospitals for the, mentally, for the uh, criminal offender, uh, uh, take the view that there's an awful lot of hypocrisy involved in it, a lot of dishonesty, that uh, a lot of criminal offenders use the uh, psychiatrist as a vehicle for achieving earlier uh, release uh, and uh, I think I'm right in saying that there's a great deal of dissatisfaction with the treatment function of the psychiatrist in a prison setting uh, that is uh, essentially punitive well it, it's very very difficult for a professional person to work in a, a prison setting because most prison settings are very, very destructive rather than constructive to the individual. The, the prison itself is often set up in a very specific way to systematically degrade the individual, and this is one of the reasons why uh, prisons don't ordinarily con contribute to the rehabilitation uh, of an individual or his reform, but actually contributes to the likelihood that, that uh, he will repeat his offense. And, and I, I think it's quite possible for a psychiatrist in such a setting to become simply an instrument of, of society's uh, punitive revenge. And, and so psychiatrists can and have in the past, uh, in many instances, I, I think, abused their medical privileges and left or distorted their role as a, as a healer in, in order to do uh, many, many things which I regard as very evil. But it doesn't have to be that way. I, I, I think a, an institution or the disposition of the uh, criminal offender can be uh, done from the very start with his rehabilitation in mind. Now, I don't think there is any place in the United States today where this is done to a really very satisfactory degree. But I, I think that in some places it's better than others. I, I think in the state of California, very strong efforts are made to minimize the harm that a prison does to individuals and to facilitate his rehabilitation. And the prison psychiatrist plays a role in not only the, the treatment of the individual, but also in structuring the atmosphere in which that uh, prison exists. Yeah, yes, but now, Bernie, isn't it true that um, a large number of important uh, policies are adopted in various states on the assumption that psychiatric expertise and psychiatric resources are available for this very liberal kind of treatment that you're talking about. When in fact, uh, the uh, skill and the expertise may not be there, the resources are not there in the sense that uh, the prisons find it difficult, if not impossible, to get enough psychiatrists to uh, go to work. Uh, the jobs in prison systems are very unattractive, frequently filled with hacks. And uh, I think it's one thing to say that uh, a, a very gifted and uh, dedicated psychiatrist 
uh, can achieve a certain amount of good uh, and to then try to establish a model uh, based on the existence of such uh, relatively unique individuals uh, which then involve great civil liberties dangers that I think Dr. Zas is concerned about, namely the indeterminate sentence and the like, in which there is no uniformity of treatment, in which, in fact, uh, prisoners may often remain in an institution for a very, very long period of time without adequate treatment. Uh, should we, in other words, look very skeptically at the kinds of models that we're uh, talking about in the criminal justice system, when the assumptions on which these models are built are assumptions which in reality and practicality are uh, false. Uh, we don't have the expertise perhaps, we don't have the people, we just can't do what ideally we'd like to do and therefore we ought to revise our notions of what the system should consist of. Well, uh, I, I would prefer to deal with that issue in, in, in this way. Granted that, there, that everything you've said is, is correct. Nevertheless, I think it's of great importance for that uh, at least some institutions should be set up uh, to serve as, as models, as pilots programs to demonstrate what can be done under favorable circumstances so that standards can be set. I, I think that this treatment uh, can, be gone, can be accomplished with full respect for the civil liberties and constitutional rights. I don't agree with you at all that the indeterminate sentence in any way violates the constitutional rights of, a, of an individual. Uh, I, I think it's completely a myth, the idea that each crime has a, a defined uh, a punishment, a price tag attached to it. I think the courts have, have always uh, tended to hold that the indeterminate sentence concept is, is constitutional. The problem is, if there is an indeterminate sentence, who makes the decisions and what kind of information is utilized in order to decide when the, the sentence is terminated? Uh, under uh, bad situations, uh, people who shouldn't be making the decisions, namely doctors, make the decision, and, and all kinds of information is used which should not be used. But it doesn't have to be that way. I, I, I think that there are, are, are uh, uh, circumstances in my own state of California, I think in England and in many European countries, particularly Denmark, it's been demonstrated that the indeterminate sentence uh, and the use of behavioral science information can be a most valuable uh, tool not to, to, to restrain people and not to degrade them, but actually to humanize them and to facilitate their restoration back to society. Have you a comment on that, Tom? Well, this is, uh, I have a lot of comments on this, uh, Alex. Uh, I think it's necessary that we state, I would prefer to state more clearly my own moral values rather than sort of imply them through, through policy decisions as, as Bernie does. Uh, it is my judgment, quite frankly, that the indeterminate sentence is more immoral, is a greater moral evil than the death penalty. First of all, this is my view. Secondly, it, I, don't, uh, I also think it's a moral evil to speak in a blanket kind of way about restoring people to society. Again, let me take Mrs. Sanger or, or Bertrand Russell. What does it mean to restore them to society? That they can be held until they promise that they, will not, that they no longer believe in the, in the beneficial value of birth control? You have but, uh, to deal with the, this concrete situation. You're, you're assuming that a psychiatrist makes only kind of one way. No, no, I don't care who makes it. Well, wait a minute. Or society or prisons or other people make only one way uh, decisions. Isn't it possible for a psychiatrist or, or an adult authority or a parole board to, to decide that irrespective of the, of the legal position that uh, Margaret Sanger's views on birth control do not represent psychopathology, that they do not represent deviance, but maybe represent genius. But if they don't maybe represent... Maybe desirable ways, and, and to, to facilitate uh, the return to society of people like uh, 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 these so that they can carry on their good work. Well, in fact, I think we have to agree that these are relatively unique sure. cases and idiosyncratic cases, and that we're talking about the uses of psychiatry in the criminal justice system, mainly for those who are burglars, who are armed robbers, who are uh, persons who have committed homicide. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it's mainly with the more serious crimes like homicide that uh, psychiatry has been concerned. And I think it would make more sense to talk about whether 
uh, not, not the Margaret Sanger type illustration, but whether psychiatry has much to offer uh, in connection with these routine garden variety crimes. Well, I, I think it can be demonstrated really, really quite accurately with figures that under the indeterminate system, a sentence system, that, that the offenders generally are restored or given their liberty sooner than they would be given under a, a fixed so, sentence So it's system. a mitigating situation, even though sure. occasionally someone remains for a, a longer period of time yeah. and feels the, the, unjustly treated. But the purpose is not to extend their, their imprisonment, but is to reduce their imprisonment. I think the purpose of the psychiatrist in the, in the prison is not to hold people in confinement. The purpose of a psychiatrist is to facilitate the release of, of people. Now, it's true that some psychiatrists have envisioned their role as watchdogs of society. They are agents a punitive uh, authority. I assure you I have the same contempt for these co colleagues of mine as you do. That I disagree very strongly in such uses and that every possible legal and medical and ethical precaution should be exerted to stop that sort of thing. But that doesn't mean that the whole uh, uh, instrument of, uh, of psychiatry, of psychology, of sociology should be just thrown away because there have been some abuses. I think we have just a few well, moments Well, I can left. see in Tom. 10 seconds, I am not implying that psychiatry should be thrown away. I am only implying that psychiatry should never be used involuntarily. This, of course, is an enormously complicated subject. Dr. Diamond spends uh, 15 weeks of a semester teaching a seminar on the subject. I do. Uh, myself, we spend 30 hours talking about the issues we've tried to cover in one hour. And uh, Dr. Zoss has written extensively on the subject. Uh, what we try to do here is not resolve anything, of course. Uh, it would be impossible, but uh, mainly to illuminate issues, uh, to explore issues, uh, to suggest uh, what the different points of view are on these issues. And I hope we've been helpful to you in doing that. We thank Dr. Thomas Sass, Professor Alexander Brooks, and Dr. Bernard Diamond for their interesting analysis of a critical problem in patient care. In subsequent programs, we shall continue to record significant concepts and controversies in modern medicine. The opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily constitute endorsement by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, the Public Health Service, or its constituents.